Hello, and welcome to the Third Dimension Blog Podcast, where we look back at the history of aviation, as well as touch on other subjects from time to time that are of special importance to us as aviators. My name is Robert Novell, and this week we're going to talk about the RJ Revolution and what it has, or has not done, for the aviation community at large. So, what brought on the RJ Revolution? Was it demand in the marketplace? Was it a need to replace an aging fleet? Or was it cost cutting by the mainline carriers? Probably a little bit of everything, but mostly it was the pilots union who approved a scope clause in their contract that allowed the carriers to begin this new venture because this was going to reduce their costs, save union jobs, and increase profits. But did it accomplish what it was designed to do? That answer is still being debated. My question for you is did the mainline carriers create real value in the marketplace? Did the airlines create real value for you as an aviator? Let's look first at what a regional airline is. They are an ACMI operator who operates under contract to fill a short-term need. ACMI operators work under short-term fixed-fee contracts called capacity purchase agreements where the regional has no revenue risk and this allows them to concentrate on keeping costs to a minimum for their mainline carrier. The costs that they are concerned with are aircraft, crew, maintenance, and insurance. The ACMI carriers do not fly under their name or flight code, but use that of the legacy carrier with whom they are under contract to. They are told where to fly, how frequent to fly, and they do no sales and marketing. In some cases, the aircraft ownership, fuel, and ground handling are also paid for by the mainline carrier. So, what does the future hold for these ACMI carriers when they want to strike out on their own? I found an interesting article on the web about Independence Air, a United ACMI carrier that broke away and became a low-cost carrier after refusing to allow their hourly costs to be reduced. To read this article, go to the Third Dimension Blog website and click on the link that I provided on the 7 June blog article to understand what happens when a company decides to take on the mainline carriers. So, why did Independence Air fail? They had the assets, highly motivated and well-trained people, and a track record that would have guaranteed success. The answer is simple. If you are not part of an airline reservation system that promotes your product, protects your routes, and controls the passengers from start to finish, you will lose. The mainline carriers have a nationwide sales force and a marketing program that reaches out and touches almost every household in the U.S. and beyond. They ensure that their pricing and service levels give them the advantage necessary to control their markets and put any new kid out of business. This is why the ACMI contract carriers must fly the colors of their mainline carrier and fly under their airline name. It's all about branding and the reservation system controls that component from start to finish. One other item that should be introduced into the discussion at this time is the impact that the reservation system had in the years following deregulation. There were a number of legacy carriers who failed as a result of a competitor's reservation system. A number of people in the industry, including the government oversight agencies, were aware of how certain carriers were being put at a disadvantage in the reservation system of others. But everyone turned their heads and looked the other way. I know of six carriers that were victims of such practices. Another point that we need to talk about is why it is being said that fuel costs are the primary consideration for the CRJ 200s being put out to pasture. This I'm not sure is true. Yes, fuel cost per seat mile is high, but if you have a lease payment for the new equipment there will be almost six times what they're currently paying per month, then how much are the mainline carriers saving? Is there another reason that has the mainline carriers moving away from the 200s and into the 76-seat aircraft? Could it be that the image of the 200s having been dubbed a circular sardine can by the public be the issue? No, because I don't think Delta would have just purchased 40 CRJ 900s with an option for 30 more if that was true. Could it be that the CRJ-200 is beginning to encounter higher maintenance costs because of a high utilization in their age? 
Are they destined to be pushed aside like the DC-9s and the early 737s? Maybe. Could it be that the mainline carriers are going to give the new equipment to ACIMI operators who have a lower cost, as compared to the size and seniority issues of the current operators? I know of two cases in the past where this solution was used by the mainline carrier in order to push the cost per hour down to meet their needs. Could this be happening again? For sure, we know that the scope clause that brought on the RJ revolution and made the 50-seat jets a mainstay for the regionals is now going to make the 76-seat jets the mainstay and the 50-seats are no longer wanted or needed by the mainline carriers. Currently, there are around 600 CRJ-200s operating in North America and Embraer has around 600 of the ERJ-135, 140, 145s operating in the same market. There is a potential market for some of these airplanes to be converted into freighters or corporate aircraft, and the emerging market in Russia, Africa, and elsewhere may absorb some. However, I think the majority will end up in the desert, but there are still other airframes whose future may be in question. And if you go to that same article I spoke of above, you will find a chart from the Regional Airline Association's website that reveals the total number of airframes total that the regional airlines operate. An interesting item for you to consider is that when Delta shut down Comair in September of 2012, they noted that cost was the primary consideration. They also announced that the 500 or so RJs would be reduced to around 100 within two years. However, the big announcement that got everyone's attention was that they would be leasing all 88 of AirTrans 717s from Southwest. Delta will become the biggest operator of the 717, a model which has been out of production since 2006, as it takes all 88 jets from Southwest, which they acquired when buying AirTran Holdings in 2011. Atlanta-based Delta said the planes will replace less efficient jets. However, Delta's acquisition of the 717s is contingent upon its pilots approving a tentative agreement to cover the aircraft. Voting will conclude June 30th on this accord, which will then allow Delta to add as many as 70 two-class 76-seat regional jets. Delta's representatives said that these actions pave the way for us to restructure and upgauge our domestic fleet, which will lower our cost, provide more pilot jobs, and improve the onboard experience for our customers. Reference that union agreement with the Delta pilots that is pending ratification, I found the following verbiage. In terms of scope, we were able to achieve important improvements from the smallest jets through international joint venture protections. Scope is the most complex section of the contract. At its core, it is about who flies Delta's passengers and ultimately about Delta pilot jobs. Without the acquisition of these new mainline aircraft, Delta will be capped at the current level of 70-76 seat jets. Ultimately, under this agreement, Delta's access to 76 seat jets will be capped at 32 less than what is allowed in the current PWA. Additionally, Delta will no longer be permitted to convert 70-seat jets to 76-seat jets going forward, regardless of the size of the mainline fleet. Delta management decides which aircraft it operates, but we have every reason to believe that Delta will soon announce the purchase of aircraft contingent on the ratification of this agreement. This will represent a major opportunity for many of our pilots to upgrade from the right seat to the left seat and will also create a need for additional hiring for the right seat. While the details are complex and best left for a dedicated negotiator's notepad, let me summarize by saying that if Delta executes its plan for its small, narrow-bodied jet flying, the result will be a major shift of block hours to Delta Mainline. The share of mainline domestic flying will increase by 21% and the ratio of mainline domestic to DCI flying will increase by 57% over the life of this agreement. It will be very interesting to see if Boeing responds to the renewed interest in the Boeing 717 by Delta and possibly others. Will they once again get into the business of building the airplane, which is now considered to be a regional airliner? Or will Boeing allow others like Canada Air and Embraer to move into their market as Airbus did? The regionals are a needed commodity, 
but I don't think that they need to be a byproduct of the mainline carriers. If the economy turns around, and I believe there could be room for a few independence air type carriers. But as we talked about last week, the reservation system of the mainline carrier is a formidable opponent. Who are the players in the regional airline industry, and who do they fly for? Once again, I went to the Regional Airline Association website and found that info, and was glad to see that there are some operators out there who fly their own colors. However, the most interesting point we have to consider is how many more of the large carriers like Comair will disappear and be replaced by a new ACMI carrier that will pay their people less and fly under contract at a reduced rate and in order to get the foot into the door. Lots of money to be made by management if they can do more for less. The issue concerning the RJs is no longer an unanswered question. They are finished and the 76-seat aircraft are in. How many 76-seat aircraft are required to replace the current fleet of RJs, ERJs? Around 650, but if the Boeing 717 becomes a player, this number will change dramatically. Before I close out part one, I want to address the issue of American Eagle and then pose a few questions for you to consider. First, I have found nothing that says for sure that American Eagle will cease to exist, but what I have found are th- three separate articles where Eagle Chief Executive Officer Dan Garten has said that there is a possibility of that occurring before years in. I have no insider information to offer up, but please remember that American owns the paper on the airplanes, just like Delta owned the paper on Comair's airplanes. American manages Eagle, as did Delta manage Comair. Does American Eagle go the way of Comair because of cost, seniority issues, and per hour pricing? You decide. But for me, I would say be prepared for the worst. I think Eagle will disappear shortly after the merger comes together and the newly packaged American, who appears to be run by U.S. Air Management, emerges back into the marketplace. I know that no one in the regional community wants to see this happen because a number of families that will be hurt. However, plan for the worst and hope for the best. Now, let's think about these questions and we will see if we can address the specifics of each later this month as I continue to talk about the facts. 1. What do the mainline carriers bring to the table and add to the menu for people in commercial aviation with the ACMI contractors they have chosen to operate their regional aircraft? 2. Do the ACMI operators who are currently operating for the legacy carriers provide their people with the tools, pay, and benefits to ensure their day-to-day success? 3. Do the ACMI carriers provide long-term job security for those they employ? And number four, what does the future hold for the U.S. if all air service is controlled by the remaining legacy carriers? Now, a few closing thoughts from the last article that I wrote for the blog. The RJ revolution is alive and well, and as we have talked about in the last two articles. But that which continues to bother me is the following. Will the unions regulate not only the growth of the regional airlines, but also control their potential for success in a free market economy? Are the unions now taking the place of the Civil Aeronautics Board, which was phased out in 1984? It is agreed that the carriers who signed the capacity purchase agreements with the network carriers will make money. But what about the people? What about the families who depend on the future of that model? The object of the CPA is to reduce the cost to the network carrier and minimize the problems associated with the workforce that are found in the unionized model of the parent organization. This being true, can we assume that all who work for a network carrier's regional airline will have a place with the mainline carrier and protect its seniority if they pay their dues working for a regional? If the answer is no, then should we not be concerned about the quality and longevity of the business model that is being created? Are the remaining network carriers, in conjunction with their regional carriers, going to control the future of air commerce in the U.S.? Good question. I will have more facts to share and more editorializing to do in future articles, but for now let's take some time to think about where the regional airlines are headed. There are no 19-seat, 30-seat airliners being produced, no 50-seat turboprops being manufactured, and no 50-seat jets being manufactured. What are the options for a regional airline when it comes to equipment should someone choose to compete against the anointed ones? 
Is this someone going to salvage the RJ200s from the desert and bring them back to life? Interesting question, to be sure. Next week, we will continue moving forward with the story and others. But for now, I want to say thanks for stopping by. And I look forward to being with you again in two weeks when, once again, we will talk about the history of our profession. Until then, take care, fly safe, and remember, all aviators are gatekeepers. Protect yourself, protect your profession, and protect the interest of all who follow in your footsteps.